every once in a great while you play a game that rocks you to the core. A game that just, well, it breaks you. After admitting to a buddy that I had only ever played the second Clock Tower game on the PS1, he immediately sent me his own copy of the third entry in the series and holy hell I'm happy he did. Clock Tower 3 is an absolute mess of conflicting gameplay ideas and a story that is just barely straddling the thin line between good writing and pure incoherent nonsense, and I'll be damned if it isn't one of the most entertaining games I've ever played before. How does that follow from what I just described? Well, I'm Jared, and this is Trash Classics. Clock Tower 3 is the story of Alyssa Hamilton, a young girl attending boarding school in London. At the start of the game, she gets a letter from her mom urging her to lay low until her 15th birthday passes, and she's about as weirded out as you would likely be after that kind of a suggestion. Right after reading this letter, Alyssa receives a call from her mom, but when she gets to the phone, she's greeted with silence on the other end. Taking the odd letter into account, on top of her mother not being reachable, and Alyssa decides to head home to the boarding house where she grew up. Upon arriving, she doesn't find her mother, but instead a very weird looking fat guy with what seems like a severe misunderstanding of what constitutes an appropriate time to put your hands on a teenager. <laughs> My sweet Alyssa. After searching the house, Alyssa stumbles across her mom's room where she starts to hear distant piano music, and I have to credit the game's developers because the motion capture and voice work in this scene do an amazing job of getting across the very subtle, almost imperceptible point that this frightens her. In fact, I'd wager some of you may not have even noticed, but there are several very subtle tells that indicate she's scared here if you're looking very closely. So after Alyssa shows us how overdosing on LSD feels, she's transported to World War II era London, where it seems she needs to right a few ancient wrongs. It looks like she has some kind of ability to put tortured souls to rest, and as we'll come to find, an obligation to free spirits from their earthly bonds and destroy supernatural beings called entities that drive people to commit insane acts of murder and torture. As the game goes on, we find out that Alyssa was born into a bloodline of what are called rooters, which are young women with the ability to interact with ghosts and the power to stop entities. On top of that, there's an evil plan to thwart, obviously, along with some significance given to Alyssa and specifically her upcoming birthday. Honestly, I know what I just described doesn't really sound like all that much. It's kind of like something you would see in a completely overhyped garbage TV show written by a hack who gets way too much credit for succeeding maybe twice in his entire career. But there's more to talk about here than just the main storyline. So the game is broken up into sections where Alyssa explores her huge hotel-sized home, which are very separate from parts where she's transported to some other time or location in order to set things right by setting free the spirits of murder victims and essentially banishing enemies to the Shadow Realm with, and I cannot be more serious with this description, a Sailor Moon transformation and a bow that shoots lightning chains. During these sections, it's not so much about the main storyline, but instead we get to explore the story of a serial killer, his victims, and the circumstances surrounding each murder. In bringing rest to the tortured souls of these victims by returning some special trinket or reuniting them with a loved one, you end up getting wrapped up in the events of their death. Each of these scenarios has an insanely unique feel to them and includes some flat-out memorable characters. On top of moments that are far more morbid than you would expect from a game with a girl in a school uniform punishing wrongdoers with the power of love. One specific example that comes to mind is a part of the game where a killer utilizes acid to blind a mother and son, then puts the two in a vat and fills it with more acid while joking that the two of them being blind means they will never find each other in the afterlife. And yes, that is one of the most terrifying sentences I have ever spoken before. There is of course a more intricate story going on in the foreground with Alyssa being a key component in some demonic slash apocalyptic stuff going down, and an even more interesting history behind her bloodline and the rooters that came before her. It's a pretty damn interesting story all things considered, but even so, I was more wrapped up in the smaller stuff going on in each area. Gameplay in Clock Tower 3 actually does a pretty good job at altering the series' blueprints while still staying relatively true to the same style and feel you saw in the other games. 
While I haven't actually had a copy of the original Super Famicom Clock Tower in my hands before, me and a friend used to get together all the time and for some reason the first US release of Clock Tower on the PS1 was always a part of those hangout sessions. In these original games, the gameplay acted as a kind of hybrid point and click adventure, with the player controlling a cursor to move their character around and interact with the stuff around them. When the game's almost mascot-like antagonist Scissorman would show up, there would be little if any offensive options, the game instead emphasizing running and hiding. Clock Tower 3 decided to ditch the on-screen cursor and play much more like a traditional survival horror title minus the tank controls. Like I said before, gameplay for the most part is broken up into exploration sections where you're running around Alyssa's house looking for clues and then being transported into the past to take out spiritual serial killers and put their victim's souls to rest. During the house segments, the game does a great job at setting up a creepy old English boarding house to explore in. There's all kinds of secret passageways to find and hell, there's even a decaying body in the bathtub because why the hell wouldn't there be? Once Alyssa gets thrown into another time, the game shifts into a much more survival horror style setup where that era serial killer du jour will chase our girl around trying to add her to their roster. Each area is laid out as a series of puzzles, much like a Resident Evil game. To proceed, keys are going to be needed and puzzles will most likely have to be solved. Most of the time, those puzzles are your more adventure game standard, and that standard means collect an item, then see what you can use that item on. I'd say 80% of the time, you'll be putting angry spirits to rest by finding trinkets they had a connection to in life, but most of the time, these will only net you usable items meant for putting a little space between you and the killer. And even though these are pretty bog standard items that could be found elsewhere in the area, there's still this feeling of satisfaction when you get rid of an apparition that made exploration annoying by grabbing onto you when you least expected it. And well, I guess that makes for a good transition into the game's combat. In the original games, there weren't exactly a lot of options to do any direct damage to your pursuer since the real focus was on cunning with escape and hiding making up most of your in-game decision making, and that strategy definitely still exists in this game. In some specific areas, hiding spots can be found and holy hell this can be stressful. There are also some really cool environmental hazards that can be taken advantage of like one-time use weapons and live wire sitting in a pool of water. On top of that, Alyssa is given a container that holds your only real offensive option. If any angry spirit or serial killer gets a little too close for comfort, you can throw a little holy water on them to temporarily stun them. You start out with a limit of four uses for this container, but you can refill it anytime you want via these little fountains scattered around. As you progress, the limit is slightly increased right alongside your options for using it. Eventually, you're gonna find doors that need a splash of holy water and portals that require a little more. And while stunning your enemies can be really, really helpful, I wouldn't rely on it too much if I were you. There's a pretty long wind-up in between hitting the button and the action actually taking place, so depending on the foe and the situation, you may not be able to get them before they hit you. Which leads us into the very, very interesting stuff that takes place when you take damage. Alyssa, instead of having a life bar, kind of just dies in one hit, but there's a stress meter on the screen which makes for a really cool twist on the genre. How it works is, attacks will fill your tension meter, and when it's full, Alyssa will go into panic mode. In panic mode, your movements are exaggerated and very hard to control, and you're also prone to fits of mental breakdown as Alyssa just covers her head and has a panic attack, requiring you to mash buttons to get out of it. While in this panic state, Alyssa only needs to take one hit before she dies, and to be honest, I actually really like this idea. It enforces the survival horror feeling of being vulnerable while making sure you don't get caught in any unfair situations. That's not to say it's perfect, though. Like I said before, physical attacks will increase your panic meter, but those attacks don't even really need to land to do that. If an enemy swings their weapon anywhere near you, you take a little bit of damage depending on how far away they are, and this feels really, really cheap. Kind of like you can't really avoid taking damage in some scenarios. And to add insult to injury, the developers will have entities ambush you at select points in an area, and there's no real way to get out of taking a pretty substantial hit to your stress meter here. Luckily, your stress meter goes down over time, and an item that lowers it even quicker can be relatively plentiful. You also stumble across a few items that'll let you take a hit while in panic mode without dying. So I won't say that these items balance things out, but they do kind of account for the cheapness you'll experience in some areas sometimes. With the layout of the general gameplay loop mirroring a Resident Evil approach with heavy amounts of backtracking and item searching, you'd figure it'd be a bit annoying having a few persistent enemies that can't be killed and who often move much faster than you. But the game does a great job of spawning them in when you're starting to feel confident, but not so often that it feels cheap or annoying. 
After all, it can be easy to miss a key item because you're locked in a life or death struggle to escape a madman wielding a showerhead connected to a vat of sulfuric acid, but a clock tower seems to know just when you've had enough and will have the entity leave the area so you have ample time to search every nook and cranny. All in all, I'm amazed that Capcom was able to stitch together what feels like a perfect middle ground between Clock Tower and RE. It's a damn near perfect survival horror clone, but we still haven't even touched on the most ridiculous aspect of its gameplay. At the end of an area, Alyssa will have to destroy the malevolent entity that's been haunting it, and in a game where Alyssa's proven herself to be quite the scaredy cat, you might imagine that would feel a little incongruent in comparison, and it most certainly does, but damn is it fun. Each boss fight at the end of a section will have Alyssa summoning a bow made out of light and the gameplay mechanics switch up to a very satisfying degree. Instead of running away, you finally get to do some real damage to your pursuer, which after the end of a very long section might be very cathartic. With three of these anchor shots holding them down, you can initiate a special one-hit kill attack, but that's easier said than done. It can take a while to get a full charge going, and some bosses have long-range attacks that let them still pose a threat even when they're locked down. These boss fight sections are really damn fun and offer a really cool release at the end of an area. Spending a whole level not being able to hurt your enemy can build up a bit of frustration, but the knowledge that you'll be able to beat them down with a little moon prism power later on can make that frustration much easier to deal with. As far as actual gameplay goes, this game is a very hard sell on paper. I mean, if I wouldn't have played it for myself, I would have assumed the horror, campiness, and comedy, both intentional and unintentional, would make for a disjointed mess of a time. But in practice, Capcom somehow made all of this nonsense work together. And if everything I just described sounds like a complete train wreck to you, trust me, I get it. I was there too. But you really have to experience Clock Tower 3 for yourself. On the visual front, this is actually a really great looking PS2 title, at least most of the time. Environments and backgrounds all have a huge degree of love put into them with interesting designs and a lot of miscellaneous clutters thrown about giving each area a more natural feel, kind of like these are actual locations and not places designed to look creepy on purpose. One graphical element that always impresses me on the PS2 are the particle effects, and in CT3 it looks like these particles are made up of a single mesh, which actually helps dust and stuff look a little more realistic and fluid, which is kind of funny since it seems like a lot of attention was given to this real looking effect while these facial animations undo all of that hard work. I don't know if cartoony is the right word to use, but it's definitely a good start, and holy hell I'd love to be a fly on the wall at these motion capture sessions. I imagine the director just told everyone to flail as much as possible and make sure to wildly over-exaggerate every single movement. And if they actually did, well, talk about a job well done. Hey, Alyssa, you've really changed since I last saw you. I'm going to go and check my grandfather's room. Hey! Even the slightest, most mundane motion in this game's cutscenes results in the wackiest, most spastic animation you've likely ever seen in your life, and god damn it do I love it. My first time experiencing this game and these animations was here on YouTube during a live stream and it was probably some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. Of course, all of the wacky animations are mostly contained to the cutscenes. In actual gameplay, movements are hand animated and actually look really good. Specifically, I was impressed by how fluid the animations were when Alessa enters her panic state. Here she moves like a person who's scared out of her mind, with her hands flailing around and her stumbling comes across as somewhat natural. The CG cutscenes look pretty good for the time and seem to be of a little higher bitrate than your average PS2 pre-rendered cutscene, probably due to this game being relatively short so less assets had to be stored on the disc, but who knows if that's actually the case. Lighting seems to be pretty pre-baked, but effective nonetheless, and I always get a kick out of 3D games that include 2D art for items and stuff. The menu design is very fitting for the style of the game, and the serial killers all look really cool looking, with each one having their own specific theme. I guess if I had to grade the game on its graphics, I'd give it a solid B+. It's not jump off the screen and impress you kind of good, but everything works together and fits perfectly with the design and feel of the game. Guys, Clock Tower 3 impressed me nearly every step of the way. Without a doubt, those of you looking for a little more survival horror in your life are going to want to seek this one out. It may not be exactly what you're used to with the genre, but it is an awesome twist on it and stays true to the tenets of survival horror while still bringing across that adventure game feel that the other CT titles had. It's a combination that doesn't make much sense on the surface, but once you really think it over, the two genres do have a lot in common, and even if you don't exactly have an affinity for either of them, 
The pure batshit insanity here should be more than enough to warrant a playthrough. On another plus side, it is filled with unintentional quotable moments, my personal favorite being the use of the term dicky eyes, which I just found out is an actual real phrase that's said by human beings, which is hilarious. Mostly because it's 2020 and damn it, I am allowed to have the sense of humor of a 14 year old. Your old mother may have dicky eyes, but she's not on her last legs yet. For real though, I could not recommend this game any harder if I tried. It is an incredibly unique game and the laughs I've gotten from it are worth the price of entry alone. And I don't need to tell some of you guys that more often than not, a game this obviously hilarious isn't exactly a joy to play. So definitely scoop this one up while you have a chance because it's not every day that a developer goes for this specific mix of features and actually pulls off a fun product. Which makes sure Clock Tower 3 earns its spot as an eternal demon hunter and a trashed classic with dicky eyes. <laughs> Well hey there, nerds and or dorks, thanks for swinging by. It feels good to jump back into these shorter Trash Classics episodes. If you like this series, I'll have some more you can check out here on screen. And if you want to support more videos just like this one, think about checking out my Patreon page. And until I see you again, please, please, don't get the dicky eyes. <laughs>